Good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and start. Uh, for those of you who haven't come to the previous lectures, my name is Sergio Lanat. I'm a neurologist at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center, moderating this course on the neurodegenerative diseases of the brain. This is the fourth lecture of the series. And just to briefly review, for those of you who haven't been present on the previous ones, uh, what we've discussed so far. So I started off the series with a very, very broad overview of what we call the neurodegenerative diseases of the brain, uh, the concept that there's many different diseases, each characterized by, by its own microscopic or how we, how we call it histological characteristics, how they look in the brain, and how these diseases, depending on what parts of the brain are affected the most, will present with different signs and symptoms. Uh, that lead to different what we call clinical syndromes. So that's, that's kind of a nutshell of what we discussed the first lecture. The second lecture led by my colleague, Dr. Nassan, delved deeply into Alzheimer's disease, um, all the way from genetics to the actual changes that happen in the brain as a result of the disease, and then leading up to the clinical syndromes, or the most common clinical manifestations as well as the less common ones. Um, and this lecture was followed by Another lecture given by another one of our colleagues, uh, Salvo, Salvo Spina, who is also a neurologist but specializes in neuropathology, and he gave you a more comprehensive view of different diseases of the brain, neurodegenerative diseases beyond Alzheimer's disease, what they look like in the brain, the dramatically different clinical manifestations that these diseases can lead to. Um, and that's where we are right now. Um, another important concept that we discussed is how Regardless of the disease that someone has, um, and regardless of the clinical manifestations, we think that all of uh, everyone that gets affected by these diseases goes through different stages that we broadly label uh, as mild cognitive impairment when the, when the illness is mild, and then progressing into more later stages of these diseases that we label as dementia. So a key concept was that not all forms of dementia are Alzheimer's disease, that there's many different causes of dementia, and we also touched on the notion that some uh, causes of dementia are treatable or reversible or modifiable, and others, unfortunately, aren't, not yet. So that's a good segue into today's talk. Uh, we're going to focus now on the science around treatment of these diseases. Um, it's only a 45 to 50 minute talk, so we're not going to get a comprehensive overview of all the different diseases and what's going on. We, I hope that you have questions for the discussion section. Uh, most of it is going to center on Alzheimer's disease, what, what has been done, uh, what are the trials that have, have been done to attack those proteins of Alzheimer's disease that, that, we, that we learned about on previous lectures. And, uh, and we're also um, going to talk about sort of the key non-pharmacological strategies um, that we use to treat and help patients and families that have these diseases. So with that introduction, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Dr. Julio Rojas, who is a, a colleague of mine, neurologist, and has a research interest in clinical trials in, in drug therapies. And that's going to be followed by another colleague of mine, Sarah Dulaney, a, a nurse in our center who's going to give you, and also a researcher who's going to give you a overview of the non-pharmacological uh, strategies. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sergio. Thank you for the invitation to um, uh, participate in these sessions. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, today, we'll talk about treatments in dementia. And it's a difficult topic. Uh, neurology has been making a great progress in treatments uh, lately. In stroke, we can cure people with very severe deficits if we bring them to the hospital in a timely manner. We can suppress the immune system to control multiple sclerosis. We have great medications to treat epilepsy. And in all these diseases, we can actually offer a very good quality of life, but we're a little bit behind in dementia. It's a difficult, difficult um, topic. But let me start with this. We often are discouraged by a diagnosis or a conversation about dementia because we have in our minds that there's nothing to do, but we have to be clear about this. The best treatment for dementia that we have today is a savvy, involved caregiver. That changes the world for patients with dementia, and that has very good opportunities of bringing a good quality of life. 
So doctors, nurses, social workers, the family and other caregivers should be involved in the care and that really makes a difference. In the meantime, we are trying to develop therapies that change uh, the perspective for our patients. And the history of the treatments in Alzheimer's disease, and I'll focus on Alzheimer's disease because it's the most common neurodegenerative disorder, um, is not very old and is not is as old probably as the discovery of the disease itself um, about 100 years ago. And um, about uh, in the 1980s, probably, um, there was this discovery that the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease had a depletion of certain chemicals, the neurotransmitters. One of the most common neurotransmitters in the brain is acetylcholine. And researchers were measuring the amounts of acetylcholine in the brain, and they realized that there was a deficiency compared to people with, uh, with normal cognition. And um, we knew from anatomical studies that a, a big source of cholinergic innervation or neurons containing acetylcholine in the brain uh, were sitting in the very core of the brain in a nucleus called the uh, nucleus basalis of Maynard. And in this study uh, published in 1982, um, these scientists uh, compared the brains of people with uh, um, Alzheimer's disease um, over here in the, in, at the bottom um, with healthy controls. And as you can see in the healthy control, the neurons in this nucleus are very healthy. Um, they have good volumes and they populate all the region very well. But those, that's not the same story in Alzheimer's disease. There, there was a depletion of these cells. The cells pretty much were dying out. And that was kind of a key. They said, ha, we can probably supplement the chemical that is emerging from these neurons and we can probably treat the disease. This was the same strategy that, that was followed by the Parkinson disease treatments. Basically, they saw that in Parkinson's disease there was depletion of dopam dopaminergic neurons and they tried to supplement a chemical that will make up for the function that was lost due to the loss of these neurons. And in fact, this, this worked. Uh, in this graph, you'll see a, a clinical trial in which they tried different doses of uh, uh, medication that supplements the, the cholinergic um, um, function of the brain. And you see here um, the change from baseline when the trial started in terms of function. The CDR sum of boxes is a measure of function. How, can, uh, pe how well can people operate in the world, dress themselves, uh, operate the telephone, um, pay their bills, and um, the trial uh, or the drugs were tested for about 24 weeks, and this was a trial in which there was uh, a placebo given. Some people were uh, randomly assigned to this group of uh, just not getting the drug but a sham, sham medication. And you, what you can see here is over the course of the trial, over the 24 weeks, people who got either the low dose of the, the drug or the high dose, five or 10 milligrams, maintain their function compared to the baseline. This is the start, and what we expect is that we'll, it will stay, stay flat like that. The, the, the function won't change, and that's what happened with both those of the medication. In the meantime, those getting placebo were declining in function over time. So that was a very uh, impressive effect of these drugs. And what happened is when, after the 24 weeks of the trial, um, everyone stopped whatever they were taking, the medications or the placebo, and the placebo continued declining, and those getting the drugs started declining too. And this was a sign that these medications don't necessarily modify the trajectory of the disease. They just support function by inducing this chemical. And it's exactly the same concept that, that was seen in, in Parkinson's disease. So we have these treatments. This, this medication is actually donepecil um, or Aricept, which is uh, the main drug that we use these days uh, to treat um, Alzheimer's disease. We have a family of medications that are called the uh, cholinesterase inhibitors, um, donepecil, rivastimin, and galantamine. They uh, have different, um, different properties, but they have the same clinical effect. So what we do in clinic is if don we try donepecil first because it's the, the easiest to take is just one tablet a day. But if for some reason that's, that is not tolerated, uh, and the most common side effects are GI side effects, uh, nausea, cramps, sometimes diarrhea, um, we can try uh, the other formulations or the other agents. Rivastigmine is, is, is good because it comes in a patch form 
that bypasses the GI tract and uh, potentially can avoid the side effects, although it's not the case all the time. Um, and then uh, galantamine may offer some benefit in people who uh, don't respond to donepecil or ribastigmine. And then kind of the same story uh, of su su um, supplying um, a neurotransmitter comes with memantine. Memantine acts in a different way. And these medications are approved only for the dementia phase. They're not approved for um, the phase of mild cognitive impairment. So they should only be used when someone gets a level of um, impairment that is compatible with dementia. What I've seen, and it's very common that we see people uh, sometimes in the MCI stage or even without any cognitive impairments and they come with memantine alone. And memantine should only be used as an add-on uh, to either donepecil ribastigmir or um, galantamine. So this is not enough, right? We, we want something that not only supplements function, uh, but also modifies the, uh, the natural history of the disease. So again, researchers, always curious, go back to the drawing board, and they notice that the initial uh, description by Alzheimer's disease in, uh, at the beginning of the last century uh, included description of these uh, entities in, in the tissue, in the brain. He observed that not only there was loss of neurons, but there was also this accumulation of, of this uh, matter uh, in, the, in the brain. Outside cells, he observed these plaques that later on we discovered that they are formed by an amyloid protein, I call, uh, or a protein called amyloid beta. And then inside neurons, there was accumulation of these uh, neurofibrillary tangles. He, he, uh, Alzheimer's named them neuro, neurofibrillary tangles. Now we know that the main component of those tangles is a protein that is usually present in, in cells, and it's, it, it helps with the scaffolding of, of neurons that is called tau. So going back to the drawing board, um, the re researchers thought, well, what if these uh, aggregates are the cause of the disease? What if these aggregates are killing neurons? And what we should be doing is to get rid of these aggregates, or maybe prevent their formation. So uh, that was the enterprise for the last 20, uh, 20 years, 20, 30 years. And we have been working on developing treatments, medications that will remove um, these uh, plaques or tangles. The main target has been the amyloid plaques. And the initial uh, attempts were uh, very difficult because the, the, the medications that were being offered caused a lot of inflammation in the brain. And actually, some people died uh, uh, as, a, um, as a result of this. And, and they were tried in, in the preclinical models in, in um, mice and monkeys. They will see uh, a lot of side effects. But with time, the technology improved. The, um, the medications uh, uh, became less, um, less toxic, more safe. And the, when I'm saying medication, um, the strategy is to create antibodies. So these are molecules that attack antigens and can be tagged by the cells of the immune system to be degraded. So that's, that's a great idea, right? We create an antibody that targets that, and we allow this, the immune cells of the body to chew it up and get rid of it. And so that was a great concept, and uh, that was what was first attempted. And the results of these initial studies um, um, were, have been coming out recently. In 2014, this is uh, what we found. This is, again, a scale where um, this is higher function, and this is lower function over here. And over, um, over 80 weeks, and as you, you can see the difference in, in the duration of the trials. The initial trials with the cholinesterase inhibitors were only you know, 24 weeks, but these are very long trials, 80 weeks of treatment. Um, the blue is the placebo, and the red line is um, the antibody against amyloid. And this antibody was, um, the, the ones that was used in this, uh, in this study was solanesumab. But you can see that there's really no difference in how both progress. They pretty much both decline um, with time, there's no difference. And this was, as you can imagine, very disappointing. Um, there were some caveats about this. These initial trials did not measure how much amyloid uh, was present in, in people's brains. You can see here, um, they were not 
uh, using the, the tools that we have now to treat or to select who will get the, the drug and who will potentially benefit from it. So some of these patients probably didn't have any amyloid to begin with. Um, and then another idea was, well, we are treating people with full uh, Alzheimer's disease, well-established Alzheimer's disease. That's probably too late. We should probably be treating earlier. And then uh, the other question was, maybe this solanosumab uh, antibody is not the best. Maybe that we could find some more potent uh, interventions. Um, so the idea around how early you can treat comes from, it's very well illustrated by this um, uh, graph uh, produced by um, Dr. Jack in, in Mayo Clinic. And he, here he portrays how conceptually uh, Alzheimer's disease evolved. So here we have the spectrum of uh, function going from normal to MCI and then dementia. And over here we have ways to detect abnormalities. And you know, we, here we are representing um, uh, the clinical function, how, how well people can operate. So this is uh, whether you can you know, remember your appointments, whether you can remember how to take your medications. Uh, people, uh, families and patients realize that there are uh, deficits, you know, in this, what defines the MCI stage, right? And the, the symptoms uh, become worse and worse, more severe uh, in the dementia phase. But we can do better. We can use some other form uh, of, um, of test to inform us whether there's any process, any abnormality. And remember, we have talked about not all dementias are the same, not all MCI cases are the same. So here we're trying to develop a marker of a specific for Alzheimer's disease. So another way of telling is we can actually test for memory. Test memory dysfunction is a, specific, a, a quite specific deficit in Alzheimer's disease. So the memory uh, impairment can actually be detected by specialized neuropsychological testing even when people are cognitively normal. When they don't have any changes, some of the tests can <laughs> s start getting a little bit of that. And even more, in the, uh, we can be very, very well characterized in the MCI stages and more, even more in dementia. But we have other things. We can get an MRI that the changes we have learned appear even before uh, uh, the, um, the memory deficits appear by neuropsychological testing. So even years before, the, chain, the, the uh, atrophy in the brain starts occurring. And even, even before that, we can see changes in the function of the brain. Um, and we can use uh, things like um, uh, uh, FDG PET to test for how well the brain is taking glucose, or markers, chemical markers in the spinal fluid, especially tau and amyloid. But we can also uh, this is a, the case of amyloid. So, uh, the theory is that amyloid is the first change that occurs in Alzheimer's disease, and probably it occurs 15, 20, 25 years, or even more before symptom onset. So we're looking at maybe 30 or 40 years old, people start accumulating amyloid. And there are mechanisms for the brain to cope with this. Um, but in Alzheimer's disease, the problem is, is very likely that these mechanisms are eroded and are as efficient, and with age, they start causing all this cascade of changes. So we do have all these techniques. We, have a, we could get an MRI these days. We use it to diagnose and to inform us who could be a potential uh, candidate. We can use this chemical analysis in the spinal fluid. And, and the latest tool is um, a, a nuclear uh, medicine neuroimaging, or, uh, molecular neuroimaging where we can actually detect the, uh, the presence of these abnormal molecules in the brain. So with this, we have come to all these trials that have used these strategies to enrich uh, the cohorts that will be uh, treated. And unfortunately, all of them have failed. And there are differences between the trials. The type of antibody, uh, that is used, changes with the trials. Some, some of them attack certain parts of the amyloid molecule. Some of them attack others, other parts of the, uh, the um, amyloid molecule. Um, how they are produced uh, and how they will help the immune system, will, uh, that's also that has been varied. Um, we have varied also uh, the time when we start offering the treatment, not only in established Alzheimer's disease, but going back into mild cognitive impairment fa phases. And really the la latest disappointment was uh, this trial on, at the bottom, aducanumab. That's, that's the one 
using this strategy of antibodies is the one that was, um, there were a lot of good expectations about it because the preliminary data were very good. But unfortunately, an interim analysis showed that there was no difference between the, the treatment groups, and it was stopped early this, this year. So this created a, a lot of disappointment and a lot of going back to the drawing board. Just when we saw that example of going from the cholinesterase inhibitors to uh, tackling the molecule, this is, where, this is what the field is, is facing now. We're going back to the drawing board and, and trying to see if there's, there are new ideas that can help us out. There's still this um, uh, idea of using amyloid, anti-amyloid therapy is still going. And there's one trial that is still being planned using an, an, anti, um, uh, an antibody against amyloid. The antibody uh, name, the antibody's name is BAN2401. Uh, um, it, will it will be using a phase three clinical trial, meaning this uh, is going to be a very large trial enrolling a lot of people, just similar to aducanumab. And you might think, well, why would you use the same strategy? And again, we are looking, or the field is looking for um, different scopes of this. The antibody is different. We will give it a chance because he's, it has progressed. But there are other ways of tackling this problem. One of the strategies is to go very early, very early into uh, treating patients, even before they have symptoms. So there's a trial that has been going on for uh, a few years now that is recruiting people who have normal cognition and people having are screened or were screened for the presence of amyloid using those molecular tools that I showed you before. And those patients who happen to have amyloid will be treated with, with a, a, an anti-amyloid um, therapy. So this study re, uh, screened about 15,000 people. About 4,000 people ended up having an amyloid pet to see if they have amyloid in their brain or not. And eventually, around 1,100 people were randomized to either having uh, the drug or the placebo. The, we participated here in UCSF in this study, and we continue following uh, patients, giving them infusions every month. Uh, we don't know still if they're getting placebo or, or the actual drug. So you can imagine how taxing this is. This is a very large trial, very uh, time consuming. Uh, it involves a lot of effort, not only from the medical community, for the participants. They are, they, a lot of uh, interest uh, is at stake here for participants. Some other, uh, they might be involved in other trials, but they, they continue going in this and this very important trial that will really inform us if this concept of going back before symptoms is, uh, is gonna be effective. And um, this week, on May 10th, there was um, a press release by um, a consortium of, of clinical trials in yeah. the nation uh, that is even pushing the envelope even further by planning this a45 presymptomatic AD trial. Here the difference is going to be that they're going to continue enrolling people with normal cognition with a positive amyloid, but in this case they're going to use two drugs. One will be to uh, prevent the accumulation of the, uh, the amyloid, and another one will be to, um, to remove uh, potential um, uh, um, amyloid that will be there. Um, so. This is one trial that is being planned, and another one is what we call a primary pre prevention trial in which we're going to recruit people with a negative amyloid. Even before amyloid can be detected in the brain, uh, people will be uh, treated with a medication that uh, will uh, prevent the accumulation uh, of, of the drug, so, I mean of amyloid. So this, this shows you how resilient the field is. And this is just one strategy that is being followed. But we really need to think out of the box. It's possible that this path will not pan out. And we need to think about other things. So another way of thinking about this is to target not amyloid, but the other protein that Alzheimer's disease, uh, uh, Alzheimer's detected, which is tau. And it makes a lot of sense to target tau because tau correlates very well with the symptoms. How much tau you have in your brain correlates with the severity of the symptoms. And where in the brain tau is correlates with the types of symptoms that you have. So it makes a lot of sense, and we have good technology to detect tau. We have antibodies that have been shown to remove tau, and these, tri these trials are ongoing. But tau is downstream amyloid. It happens after amyloid has been uh, detected. So 
some people say, well, you need to start looking before amyloid happens, before amyloid appears. What is causing amyloid? Uh, this is a very important question. And um, thinking out of the box, um, we are looking at uh, potential effectors or aggressions that the body is exposed to. In this particular case, infections like herpes virus or um, bacteria that cause gingivitis. And some uh, studies will be launched that will try to um, prevent the toxic effects <laughs> of these infections. Um, another uh, line of research is going upstream before amyloid happens is what, what about the, the good blood pressure control, good control of cardiovascular risk factors? There's a, um, emerging studies are showing that intensive blood pressure control in midlife uh, prevents the onset of mild cognitive impairment, and I think we're going to be seeing uh, a, little bit, a little bit of this. And then if, if um, we're thinking really before, uh, before the onset of amyloid, and we want to think really out of the box. We are coming with strategies that may be some, somewhat laughable and uh, unthinkable, but how about injecting energy into the brain and uh, allowing it to have the tools to fight oxidative stress and to have the tools to really keep the memory, uh, the energy going. So we're, we're probably be hearing about very uh, uh, innovative things. So I want you to take this message with you. Uh, the, the development of therapies in Alzheimer's disease is very challenging, but it's an active field. We're not going to be defeated on this. We have the generational responsibility to tackle this problem and to leave something better for the generations coming behind, uh, behind us. Um, current approaches uh, for the treatment are pursuing very early intervention. And stay tuned. You will see that uh, in the next uh, half an hour, we can make impact now. We don't need to wait for, for all this to happen. Thank you, and we'll have time for questions for Julio and everybody afterward. Um, so I'm Sarah Delaney. I'm a geriatric clinical nurse specialist at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center, and I'm here to talk to you about non-pharmacological strategies and resources that are available in San Francisco for people who are living with dementia now. And I'm going to talk about general strategies, and I just want to for you to keep in mind that when you've met one person with dementia, you've only met one person with dementia. And so when I'm talking about these general strategies, uh, just realize that they really need to be personalized to the person, you know, the symptoms they're having, the context they live in, and the caregivers who are caring for them. So in the mild cognitive impairment stage, not everyone who has MCI will progress to um, full dementia. And, and so in that phase, we really want to focus on the, these preventative strategies, managing blood pressure and other cardiovascular risk factors, um, focusing on health promotion through exercise, diet, staying engaged. You know, the mild cognitive impairment can be um, annoying. Uh, but it, it doesn't impair your day-to-day -day function as, as much as it would in day-to-day in -day life. So you don't want to let these annoying symptoms cause you to withdraw socially or avoid you know, situations that might be em embarrassing, but kind of keep a sense of humor and stay engaged um, with life. And use tools like um, apps and calendars and to-do lists to help you uh, stay engaged. So uh, as you get into the early stages of the disease, we, you know, we need to take things a little bit more seriously and think about um, safety risks. So in this state, when you are given a diagnosis with dementia, you're reported to the um, Department of Public Health and have to uh, pass a driving exam to continue driving. And so even though you may pass the exam and be able to continue driving, you want to think about driving alternatives and kind of have a plan for how you would uh, maintain your life without that option. And it, it may not be a big deal in, in this area. Um, but with people who live in other areas who have weapons in the home, um, we really, you know, people can become paranoid and um, have symptoms where even though in the rest of their life they never would have done anything to harm themselves or someone else, 
uh, we don't want to have that risk as their brain changes and their behavior is less predictable. So those are two uh, key safety risks in the early stage. And again, we also want to continue with uh, promoting a healthy lifestyle, promoting sleep. And I'm not going to go into detail about these things because I understand you're going to have a separate lecture about those. Um, and I also think it's key for both the person and the people in their life to, to try to learn about the disease and what they can do now and, and also to help plan for the future. So I, I like this concept of doing what matters most in this period where um, you know there's a lot of uncertainty and um, you know we're not sure if you'll have you know a five year progression or a twenty year progression and and so you know some people I've worked with create a bucket list with their families and kind of try to use the time where they're still pretty functional to um, do what they can have always wanted to do. A lot of people get. Um, a, feel they want to give back or have some purpose in their lives. And participating in research can be a way to do that. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has peer support programs. And even just participating in advocacy and you know trying to get more funding for research and care for people with dementia can really give people a sense of purpose um, when they're dealing with a diagnosis in the early stage. It's also really important in this early stage, while someone still has the capacity to make decisions, to choose a health care agent and meet with an elder law attorney to complete uh, legal and financial planning. And I listed a couple of resources here um, on ways to have these conversations with family members. And just to reiterate that it's not just about meeting with an attorney or signing forms, but also about communicating with your loved ones about um, you know, what your values are and, and what you would want in the future, and also communicating with your doctor um, so they have a sense of uh, what you think about these things. So the middle stage is um, why people like me have a job. <laughs> so this is where people really start needing a lot more um, help physically, and it, it becomes a struggle for themselves and for their caregiver. Um, you know, people uh, tend to want to stay independent. They may or may not have insight that they need help. It becomes a bit of a dance of figuring out how to help people without doing too much. Um, uh, communication becomes more challenging, and uh, some of the behavioral symptoms in this phase um, can really be surprising and challenging for um, family members. So we try to focus on what the person still can do and strategies for supporting them to be able to do as much as they can. And um, structure and routine is one way to help support someone to be able to do as much as they can for as long as possible. It's also a, a phase of a lot, a lot of coping. Um, this is where the person really see, starts to seem really different. And um, you know, so caregivers and families, it, it can be a really challenging time. And um, in the late stage, there's much more limited communication. People often are able to say only a few words. Uh, it can be challenging for families to feel like they are really able to connect with the person. Often we try to focus on um, sensory modes of connecting through music or touch, um, just sitting with someone. In the, the late stage, um, it can be challenging. You know, people don't think often that you do that Alzheimer's is a terminal illness, and it, it really is. So the brain loss eventually causes um, difficulty with swallowing, and so most people will eventually um, get pneumonia from um, aspirating either through trying to eat or swallowing their own saliva, and um, that's often how um, people eventually pass away. They tend to stop recognizing <laughs> food and have decreased appetite. Um, they have increased infections, pneumonia, also um, urinary tract infections. They become less mobile. Um, so this is also another time where uh, you know it's a people need a lot of physical help, um, and families often need a lot of um, more emotional help as well in dealing with the loss. So I'm going to go back to the behavioral symptoms. 
Um, like I said, they're, they're more common in, in a disease like Alzheimer's in the middle stage, but in other diseases like FTD, they may be the first, um, you know, symptom as a real personality change and, um, behaviors. So this is, uh, prevalence among people who had Alzheimer's and you can see apathy is, uh, has some crossover with depression, but it's where people really who may have been active and internally driven to do things just really lose um, motivation and can become really passive. And we don't hear complaints from this about this symptom in um, long-term care facilities, but f this can really be uh, troubling to families who um, are used to their loved one, you know, being very active and involved in things, and, and they just really... Um, you know, have, have little motivation to do things. I would say uh, sleep disruption, it tends to be one of the um, challenging behaviors where that can lead to placement. If, if someone is having to stay up with someone and they're losing sleep, that's often really not a sustainable situation. Um, delusions, hallucinations, aggression, um, are also really challenging. So, um, you know, the behavior symptoms can be a reason why um, people are not able to stay in the home. Anxiety is more common, I would say, in the earlier stages, though it can um, continue throughout the course. The aberrant motor be behavior is often, um, uh, you'll see the pacing, kind of aimless pacing or the repetitive um, pill, pill rolling type hand movements with the hands. Um, and euphoria is much less uh, common of a symptom. So when someone has a new symptom in dementia, one of the things we want to try to determine is, is it, an, is it a sudden problem that may have an underlying medical cause or reversible cause, or is it something that we anticipate as a part of the dementia? So really getting a sense of when did the behavior start? Did it start over the course of months um, and slowly is getting worse? Or is it something that just all of a sudden my mom is not sleeping at night at all? She's up, you know, seeing bugs on the wall. And that would um, be an indication that we might want to look for an underlying infection um, or something like dehydration, constipation, uh, really get a med be seen by a doctor and get a medical workup. Sometimes uh, acute confusion or behavior change can be a sign of an underlying treatable medical problem. Uh, for behaviors that we would anticipate in, as a part of the disease, we um, understand them as both a symptom of the neurodegeneration. So as Julio said, depending on the area of the brain that's affected, that can determine the kind of um, behaviors that someone may have. And also the, the neurodegeneration itself can lead to um, a lower th stress threshold. So um, all of us, you know, if we're tired and hungry, are going to have a lower th stress threshold. And so similarly, um, someone without, uh, you know, with less of a frontal lobe or um, who has less capacity in their brain to kind of understand what's going on in their environment, they're going to have less ability to control their behavior. So um, contributing factors can be that they're tired, they're hungry, they need to go to the bathroom, they're not able to communicate that, they're frustrated. It can be, you know, the way the caregiver is communicating with them or something in the environment. People can become very sensitive to noises in the environment, changes in the environment, uh, new caregivers. Uh, so we use this model to provide a framework for evaluating and understanding what's going on with the behavior to help us come up with a, a plan of, of how to support the person. And we start with kind of really describing how the behavior unfolded. Like I said, when did it start? Uh, what's making it better or worse? And then investigating from, from the caregiver, from the person with dementia, and, and the environment, what might be contributing. And given that information, we'll come up with a plan. Um, we also often want to focus on helping the caregiver understand what might be going on, um, trying to get them some support around um, managing the behaviors and, and any resources. Um, you know, respite is often helpful. Caregivers dealing with strong behaviors often need respite. And then we just want to follow up because sometimes the um, strategies don't work and we, we don't want to leave people hanging. 
So we're going to walk through a, a case, and um, this is a common one. So my husband is following me everywhere I go, even in the bathroom. He wants to be next to me every second of the day, and I can't get anything done. Uh, so this is, we would call so this like shadowing, and it can be associated with anxiety. Um, and uh, so for the person with dementia, we asked when it started. It started six months ago. It's kind of just getting worse. And he's especially distressed when his wife leaves the house. And so she's pretty careful never to leave him alone. Um, and she understands that this is common in, in people with Alzheimer's disease, although she's getting worried about getting her paperwork done. You know, she has a lot of insurance issues to deal with. And she's not particularly stressed. Sometimes if people can't find someone, they might leave the house and wander. So that is a real safety risk. She's not worried about that because she doesn't leave them home. And um, they don't have a lot of help uh, outside the home. So um, maybe a part of the reason why she's such a strong anchor for him. Um, let's see. She's actually a great caregiver. You know, uses humor. She's affectionate. She's relaxed. She does put her need, husband's needs before her own and, and maybe partly why she's getting behind on her paperwork. And the way their house is set up, they live in an older house where things are more closed off. So she could kind of close herself off in the office if she wanted to. And, um, and things that they enjoy doing together are mainly watching TV, although they are pretty social. So our plan for this case is to talk with a doctor about considering a medication for anxiety, probably an antidepressant. Um, we might consider using a reward, like a favorite treat, and see if he could you know, give her 30 minutes to do some work if he knew that he was going to get something special after that. Um, we want to help the caregiver understand uh, shadowing as a common symptom. And you know, he, they've actually used a handheld timer for other things for him to help him wait. And so we thought that might be um, something to use to just give her 30 minutes. And also trying to distract him with a, um, his favorite TV show and a snack or a friend. So um, that's sort of how DICE works in a really simplified way. And um, when we evaluate, you know, in a week or so, see if it was successful. These are the kinds of questions, and you know, brainstorming. If if it didn't work, what else might we try? So we're going to watch this video, and um, I'm not going to go right into discussing it, but I just so you can kind of think about it, and then when we have the panel up here, we can kind of do it as a group. Think about the dice uh, for this. The blue. A-Y-S, right? Yes. Like, never seen for a long time, don't know how to dare to see. In the early stages, she was very aware that she was losing her memory. You see a whole range of emotions uh, that a person goes through because they're very, very frustrated. You know, why can't I remember? Why can't I articulate myself? When is your birthday? Oh. Well, what's your birthday? Today. Well, uh, she would actually tell me, you know, I don't want to live anymore. I want to die, actually. When she was so depressed, she would just cry. Hello, Ika. Hello, Mom. Yeah, she will move you, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I go, I go, I go, I go, I go, I go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that what people see as frustration and anger and agitation, I see as an attempt by the person to hold on to whatever faculties they have left. So sometimes he will hold your hands to pinch you like this. <laughs> but it's okay. See, will it go only? But uh, some uh, people it doesn't like every time. So especially daily. And it really doesn't matter how many nursing degrees you have or diplomas or what experience you have. When it comes to dealing with a person with dementia, uh, it's about dealing with people. You know, I, I look at my, at my mother more as a child in her behaviour. You know, get to smile and laugh and, and not take it too seriously if she has a temper. 
So Haley really didn't work out. You know, she did. She didn't get the memo. Yeah, I give you a screen. I give you very good. Yeah. Ayo. Oh, wow. I love you. You turn me. You have to. Why are you hitting her? Why are you hitting her? You know how you make, you make me. You, you don't. Why? 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 We don't. Like it's okay. Okay. No, I help you. Don't. Don't. Don't, don't hit. Yeah. Don't hit Mary Jean. Okay. Yeah, see, I love you. Okay. Get, get out. Okay. Come, okay. Come, come, okay. Come, come, drink drink first. I, I go. I go. Okay. Get out. Get out. <laughs> no. 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 It's okay. <laughs> Is she like that every day, Don't every morning? Up. If you change her that you force, she's making get angry. But okay. there is no it's choice. It's 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 no, 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 no. no it's, okay. Okay. It, it, it. it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Come, 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 Okay, okay, give me a hug. Okay. Okay? Give me a hug. Okay? Oh, it's the highest people out, you know, looking after someone with dementia. So I did want to talk a little bit about um, hospitalizations for people with dementia. Often are pe pe uh, people are surprised that, um, you know, hospitalizations are not necessarily good for um, our patients who have dementia. Obviously, there are some reasons why you may need to go to the hospital. Um, but, you know, being in an unfamiliar environment where you're often stuck in a bed for most of the day and, you know, people may not realize um, how much help you need or don't need, um, people actually, uh, depending on their level of cognitive um, impairment upon going into the hospital, if they're cognitively impaired going in, they come out much uh, more functionally impaired, which can be a challenge for the caregiver. If they went into the hospital and they were able to go to the bathroom and they were able to get up and walk and then they come out of the hospital and now they need help transferring and they're incontinent, you know, it can really increase burden. So, um, you know, as I said, the way that hospitals are run are often, you know, not really designed to be the, the most friendly places for people with cognitive impairment. Um, they often uh, can lose weight for, from not eating and become dehydrated and have problems with, you know, new medications. And it often can be uh, leading to institutionalization. A lot of the reasons why people with dementia are hospitalized, we think, could be preventable if, um, you know, they had really more proactive care and outpatient support. So um, looking at the Medicare claims data, a lot of the majority of the hospitalizations were related to UTIs and pneumonia, uh, which could be treated with antibiotics outpatient, uh, heart failure and uh, uh, COPD exacerbation could be possibly better managed outpatient, and then 13% from dehydration. So, you know, people are at risk for just simply not drinking enough or if they get diarrhea and aren't replenishing their fluids. Um, the Number one reason for injury-related hospitalizations were falls, and um, people with cognitive impairment are at higher risk for falls. They're also more at higher risk for injury related to falls. So um, hip fractures and head injuries are more common, and it's actually less common that um, they would get wrist fractures. So people without cognitive impairment are more likely to protect themselves from a fall, and fracture their wrists, whereas people with cognitive impairment are less likely to get upper limb fractures. When you think about behavior-related hospitalizations, uh, it, there's been one analysis that, that found that actually it was the caregiver's distress associated with the um, behavior that led, that was more strongly associated with the ED or hospital visit, and that psychotic symptoms alone um, for example, in the advanced stage when the caregiver may have been dealing with this for a while and they kind of understood how to deal with it, it was associated with fewer visits um, to the EDR hospital. 
so in a um, literature review, these interventions were seen as ways to help prevent hospital unnecessary hospitalizations. So things that I've already talked about, um, and really, you know, it, it focuses largely on giving caregivers the tools and then providing more outpatient um, support and access to care. Which is why. <laughs> Uh, some uh, some clinicians at the Memory and Aging Center developed the Care Ecosystem, which is uh, the program that I primarily um, work with. And this is a team-based model of care that can be delivered primarily over the phone. Um, we've been testing this model in a randomized control trial since 2014 um, with patients across the state of California and also in Nebraska and Iowa. Um, and we're continuing with grant funding to provide uh, this care through the Memory and Aging Center Clinic and working with other health systems to expand access to this level of care. Um, so we've created a role called the Care Team Navigator who is an unlicensed person that we train um, to have a pretty strong understanding of dementia and, and community resources and how to support caregivers. We have protocols that help guide them on um, things to look out for. And there's an interdisciplinary team that um, works to both supervise and support the um, the CTN. So if the caregiver has a question they don't have the answer to, they have um, access to people who can help them. And they um, collaborate with the existing healthcare providers. So it's a supplement. Um, and I can't talk about our outcomes because the publication is under review, um, but we've been happy with uh, <laughs> our, the impact. And um, so I just want to recognize that, you know, the family caregiving is an urgent public policy issue. It's becoming more urgent. In 2010, there were seven um, potential family caregivers for every person 80 years and older. And by 2050, there will be less than three um, family caregivers for every person over 80. And, um, you know, we, we can't assume that family caregivers are just going to be available um, without, you know, support to um, manage care for these people and, um, you know, need to um, increase support for them. Speaking of support in San Francisco, um, Sir, do you want me to talk about some of the resources we have available here? When working on advanced care planning, um, the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform have um, an elder law attorney referral service, so you can help you find um, an attorney to help you with advanced care planning. The Department of Aging and Adult Services has a benefits resources hub, so that's a way to connect with county um, funded resources like in-home supportive services. They have some case management. These are um, public benefits that are income based. There's the Bay Area Caregiver Resource Center that's um, run by the Family Caregiver Alliance. We're really lucky to have them. They're a nonprofit that's been around for a long time. They do in-home caregiver consultations. They provide counseling and um, respite, as well as educational programs. The Alzheimer's Association, I found their website a little bit difficult to navigate, so I use this communityresourcefinder.org. Um, where you can search for their educational events and it also lists their um, caregiver support groups. And I just listed some adult day health programs in San Francisco. I didn't go into all the assisted living options and um, in-home care, but just wanted to mention we had a recent meeting with Institute on Aging and, and they're taking a, a bigger interest in um, dementia and, and targeting services for um, people with dementia. So they might be stepping up and um, filling some gaps in San Francisco. So um, that's the end of my presentation, and I understand we're going to have a panel, and we can talk about the video, maybe. I'm Cindy Barton. I'm a geriatric nurse practitioner. I've been at the Memory and Aging Center for about 20 years, and I see um, patients and families in clinic and in research. Hi, I'm Jennifer Merrilies. I'm also a clinical nurse specialist, as is Sarah, um, at the Memory and Aging Center. I work with Sarah on the care ecosystem and um, work on various projects really focused on dementia family caregivers, both in sort of the clinical setting and also um, in research. 
Hi, I'm Adam Boxer. I'm a professor of neurology here at UCSF, and I lead the clinical trials program where we test new therapies for people with different uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And I also lead some national efforts where we're trying to organize research networks that will be available to test new therapies in different forms of dementia. Great. So with that introduction, maybe I would start with you, Dr. Boxer. Um, given your position, um, maybe you can share with us your thoughts uh, first about sort of a, your own perspectives on, on the history of the clinical trials for neurodegenerative diseases and, and, and uh, briefly, <laughs> and how it's, um, how in your mind it's going to, how this trajectory is going to look like in the future, given especially the, the failures that we've just encountered with uh, Alzheimer's disease trials. Sure. Wow. Um, well, we, I don't think I have enough time to go through everything, but, um, well, I, first let me just say that Dr. Rojas did a fantastic job of reviewing sort of the history of clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease and where we are. Um, and so, um, I think, you know, I don't have a lot to add to what, to what, uh, Dr. Rojas said, but, um, I've been doing this since I started here at UCSF. Well, we probably started our program about 15 years ago, and I think we've seen a lot of changes. When we started, um, as Dr. Rojas mentioned, sort of the first sort of exciting therapeutic option we thought for Alzheimer's disease were drugs that might remove this protein called amyloid from the brain. And now, about 15 years later, we've had a series of many, many disappointments um, with uh, different uh, anti-amyloid therapeutic trials. And yet there's still a little bit of hope, maybe, that if we go really, really early on and we use multiple therapies, that, um, that, that removing amyloid from the brain might eventually help to prevent Alzheimer's disease. But I think more and more we're becoming pessimistic that, um, that even though we think amyloid is, is an important Part of Alzheimer's disease, it may not be the best target for a therapeutic. And so um, now there's, there's a real thought that this other protein that Dr. Rojas mentioned called tau, uh, which is really much more strongly linked to the sim symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, but also the symptoms of other uh, brain diseases as well, like um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy that football players get. Um, it may be a better target for therapeutics because um, we know that the amount of tau in the brain and where it is is really strongly linked to symptoms. So maybe um, what we, you know, even though we think that amyloid is important for the disease, it just may not be something that we can target with a medical therapy and that tau might be a better target. Um, but even if um, tau doesn't work, uh, I think we've all been really influenced by looking at the successes in cancer therapeutics. And I think there's a real feeling that we need to sort of adopt the same strategies that over the years have begun to bear fruit in cancer. And so one idea is that um, we need to just test more therapeutics in people. Um, we often get really excited when we see that we've uh, cured a mouse of Alzheimer's disease, but unfortunately we've cured mice probably thousands of times of, of what we call Mouseheimer's disease, and none of those therapies have really panned out in humans. And so I think there's, there's sort of a new enthusiasm just to, to try and test more therapies and try different approaches, and I think Dr. Rojas really um, highlighted that, that we need to just think of more and creative ways to, to target these diseases. Um, the other, I think, think that, thing that we've learned from cancer is that um, there is really an important genetics of Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, and we haven't probably paid close enough attention to the genetics and biology of these diseases, but if we let um, the genetics guide us to particular therapies, that might be a more successful way to target diseases. And so um, what we know is that most people who get Alzheimer's disease are older, and they're 65 or older when they get sick, and genetically, there are a whole series of different risk factors. Um, that, that are probably related to older people getting Alzheimer's disease. But none of these risk factors really involve amyloid or the protein tau, but they involve the immune system. And, and so there's probably a big role for how your immune system works and how um, it responds to maybe infections or, or just aging. As you age, your immune system starts to get revved up because it's trying to clear out the old, you know, the, old, the elderly proteins that are maybe not working so well. And, that, and it may be that um, that's an important process in Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And so 
Um, one idea is that if we find people who have clear genetic risk for these diseases and we know what their genetic risk is, we can target a drug towards these individual subsets of people. And if you think about cancer, that's how people, that's how um, some therapies were found that treated specific forms of breast cancer or melanoma. And we think that a similar approach might work for dementia. Mm -hmm. um, the other idea is just to really focus more on this idea of the immune system and think of that as a better target. So I think um, what you're going to see over the, the next few years is, is sort of people moving away from the idea of amyloid as, as a treatment modality. There's a few last-ditch attempts to really find people long before symptoms start and treat them with anti-amyloid agents, but I think more and more we're going to be thinking about tau, the immune system, and other sort of um, rare uh, causes of dementia where we know there's a single gene that we can potentially correct, even maybe with gene therapy. Um, and uh, if we can show that we can fix these very rare forms of dementia, that might lead us to a cure for more common forms of dementia. Fantastic. Very comprehensive response. Um, and I have a question for Cindy and Jennifer. Uh, any thoughts around things that you think are in the horizon in terms of like innovative um, management strategies and, and also speak more to what uh, you feel Alzheimer's Association is doing in terms of, you know, handling this illness at a population level. Um, I, I think I'll answer the question um, maybe from the perspective of the family caregivers and what we've, family caregivers of taking care of people with dementia have actually uh, benefited, they've been the subject of a lot of research over the years. And what we've learned is that most family caregivers do better if they get education and they get support and they learn skills on how to manage. And I think the video that Shara Sarah showed um, is like a, a good demonstration of like some of the skills that people have to learn, sort of how you change the way you communicate with somebody who has a memory problem, the way you sort of set up the environment um, to make um, the interactions more successful. So um, we rely a lot on these national organizations like the Alzheimer's Association, Family Caregiver Alliance, our own local memory and aging center. Um, to help provide that kind of education and the support. So learning about diseases, attending support groups, um, and learning sort of new alternatives and sort of strategies um, from, from other caregivers, I think is a super important step to help caregivers learn how to manage um, what's going on. And then I'll just expand a little bit on um, some of the programs that Sarah mentioned. So the care ecosystem, which um, we've been involved with with the development and the implementation, as Sarah said. We part, a big part of the care ecosystem was recognizing that we wanted to provide very person-centered care, and we also really wanted to acknowledge that the family caregiver is a really important part of that care, and that we have to help caregivers to take care of themselves. So a lot of what we do in the care ecosystem is try to help caregivers learn how to promote their own health. A lot of caregivers give up their insurance. They don't go to their own doctor's appointments because they're so busy. So we look for strategies in a real sort of personalized way of helping that, those caregivers cope with the stress, learn new skills, become educated, and also take care of their own health. And I think that idea is really, um, we're seeing a lot more development of programs like this around the country. Um, and then I'll also add to the Institute on Aging that Sarah mentioned, um, we met with them recently, we've had a couple meetings with them. Um, and I think they're a program to watch. I think they're, they're busy renovating a building in the Presidio right now. They really um, have, I think, a lot of innovative ideas about, um, about day programs for people with dementia, about exercise programs, about really thinking out of the box of what sorts of services could they provide to help family caregivers. So I, if you live in San Francisco, I'd keep an eye on them. And then I'd also look globally. So um, uh, Australia happens to have a really great um, support system that their country has adopted on helping people get diagnosed and how to manage care. And one of the, one of the things that sort of it, um, has attracted our attention that we're going to keep an eye on is um, they have these behavior task force that um, teams of clinicians that will go out to people's homes and help when there's different issues going on that, that are either risky or just um, really hard for the caregiver. So problematic behaviors, agitation, sort of like the video that you saw. So I think that's something that a lot of us are interested in sort of developing um, if we can in this country. 
there's probably more that I'll say, but I'll mm -hmm. think about it while Cindy talks. <laughs> okay. Um, I thought I'd maybe answer more from the advocacy and policy side um, in terms of some local organization and, and things to keep your eye on or think about getting involved in as a volunteer or uh, donating to. Um, and one is CANR, the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform that Sarah mentioned. You know, they do do individualized sort of counseling and legal advice and have a legal re uh, referral service. But they also have been, since the early 80s, at the forefront of really advocating for policy change in long-term care and residential care. So they've done a lot around ensuring staffing levels in nursing homes and residential care facilities and um, training that's required. They're now really working very hard around reducing the use of drugs or medications in facilities and monitoring that. They've developed an extensive database on their website about different facilities. So if a family's looking, they can see what's the feedback on that place. You know, should I consider, does that the right place for my family? Is it the right size? They also have incredible information about um, what questions to ask if you're touring a facility. So this is a really fabulous advocacy group that has really been tireless over the past 20 years, 30 years, 30 years, <laughs> um, really trying to advocate especially for people in, in residential care um, at the sort of legislatively and through litigation. They've done a fair amount of litigation. They have lawyers on, on um, staff. And the other would be the Alzheimer's Association. And I think although that is, their name is the Alzheimer's Association, and many diseases now have very specific um, advocacy groups for their specific diagnosis, the Alzheimer's Association does cover other than Alzheimer's disease. So they do advocate, and they have national, they have state, and they have local offices. Um, and they really have done an incredible amount of advocating at the policy level for legislation. Again, around things like um, um, staffing levels. Um, in the state of California, in the past couple of years, they were able to advocate for increased number of Medi-Cal waivers so for dementia patients. So Medi-Cal will pay for people to be in a skilled nursing facility, but often people who have dementia don't need a skilled nursing facility. And these waivers allow Medi-Cal dollars to be used to keep them in the home with care in the home or in a residential care facility that isn't at the SNF level. So they've, they advocated to double the available waivers, and that was that was passed in 2017. They've also advocated around training for certified nursing assistants who provide the majority of care in facilities or in homes, that they have eight hours of training every year um, around dementia care. So they've done an incredible amount of advocating. They're focusing now a lot on early um, early detection and diagnosis of people with dementia, really working with primary care providers and working with public health um, departments to try and get people evaluated and diagnosed early. So, you know, I think there's a lot of focus um, and a lot of support in, in those organizations. So the question is if uh, we are aware in any studies that are targeting not the underlying proteinopathies of Alzheimer's disease so much, but you know, preserving neuronal integrity and preventing neuronal loss uh, associated with these diseases. Yeah. That's a very good point, and I think you hit the jackpot there. Because we are treating um, or trying to pursue strategies uh, for treating these diseases based on uh, contiguity. We see cells dying and we see proteins next to them. Hence, we need to get rid of the proteins because those are the cause. It, it, Alzheimer's was very careful in, in not saying that the proteins were causing, or that those aggregates were causing cell death. But, you know, it's simplistic, right? It's, it, the, the example I, I pay all the time or the mention of the time is, is like you go into the cemetery and you see the, the crosses or the stones and you say, who killed these people? Well, the crosses and the stones. We need to come up with a treatment against the crosses and the stones, and that's how we're going to save people. So the key, the key here is how to, yes, the, the concept of neuroprotection. How do you keep neurons healthy? The price we have to pay for being in this atmosphere of 21% oxygen is that all living systems tend to go to oxidation. We're all oxidized. We buy an apple, put it on the counter, leave and come back you know, two weeks later, it oxidizes. That's the price we have to pay for being here. We have uh, systems to fight that oxidation, but with age, 
those systems also go bad. So the main risk for neurodegeneration is aging, but aging is not necessarily a disease. So we should, we should look at aging not as a matter of how, how long you've lived, but how close you are to disease, to a disease state. So you could be four years old and be very aged if you have uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled hypertension, you know, if you had, you've been exposed to toxins. But you can be 95, 98, and be very healthy. So I think the key is not necessarily going after, you know, what, what seeing whether the neurons are alive or have the neurotransmitter or not, or they have shows of, uh, uh, science, they show signs of abnormalities. But going back to this concept of how do we uh, uh, allow the systems in our body to stay away from disease. And, and I, I, that's why one of the reasons I brought this, this uh, concept of the blood pressure. And, and, and healthy lifestyle. I think the trials is a very important enterprise, but we have also a lot of things on, on our side uh, mm -hmm. by keeping a, a healthy lifestyle. And I think the evidence supports that, that good sleep, good diet, good exercise, all those things maintain function uh, uh, at the cellular level too. And, and that's a good uh, reminder of next week's talk, <laughs> which will cover all of these lifestyle and uh, other like modifiable factors that uh, data is showing can be health promoting to the brain, uh, you know, with underlying molecular reasons why that is the case. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add to um, Dr. Ross's answer that there are some um, drugs that are specifically targeting either maintaining synapses or the connections between neurons um, through specific growth factor receptors. So. Um, down at Stanford, uh, there are some researchers that have developed a drug that do that, that they're testing for Alzheimer's disease. And then, um, yeah, there are, there's this idea that there are certain factors in the brain that help neurons to survive, and there are some drugs that can either act, you know, act like those factors or activate the receptors. So the question is if there's any role for stem cell therapy in neurodegenerative diseases. You have the mic. <laughs> yeah, I'll start with the mic. Um, yeah, there's there's a great interest in in stem cells um, as some sort of therapeutic modality. It sort of depends on the disease. So um, in Parkinson's disease, there are specific neurons that um, produce a neurotransmitter called dopamine that degenerate, and there's some evidence that that stem cell therapies to replace that specific form of neuron might be helpful. Um, in Alzheimer's disease, it's a lot more complicated because there are all kinds of neurons that seem to be dying all over the brain. And so it's, it's probably a lot farther away to try and, you know, replace those cells with neurons. But there is a evidence from, from mouse models that if you put stem cells into a mouse Alzheimer's or mouse, mice, mouseheimer's brain, that those stem cells um, actually release a lot of growth factors that actually help some of the neurons to survive. So. Um, probably not, it's probably going to be a while before we act for real stem cell therapy, but maybe stem cells will be used because they can produce other things that are good for the brain. Any words of caution that you would want to add uh, around, there are people yeah, that are, yeah. That's a good point. So any, you know, there are a lot of people, a lot of charlatans, literally, out there on, on the internet who will, and we've had patients mm -hmm. who've, um, you know, been given the number of someone who they can consult for fifty thousand dollars in cash over the phone, and then they're told that, um, you know, oh yeah, I can treat your Alzheimer's disease or whatever with stem cells, but first you have to fly to wherever some uh, country where it's not regulated, and then bring another fifty thousand dollars in cash with you. This is one of my patients that happened to. We'll inject you, and then um, you know when it's working um, because sometime in the next three weeks to a month you'll get really hungry, um, and that's that's when you know. And then literally that's that's what they told one of my patients. So none of these people on the internet um, are reputable. It's all complete um, nonsense, and uh, it's really terrible that people are taking advantage of vulnerable people. Um, so we have a, a program that's fashioned after something that started at Northwestern, which was called a buddy program, and it was actually initiated by a pharmacist who had mild cognitive impairment and really wanted to contribute to the education. And so they started a program where they paired students, medical students, volunteered, and they paired with them, them with people who had mild cognitive impairment. 
um, over the course of a year. And it wasn't meant to be a clinical experience in terms of what symptoms are you experiencing. It was really meant to be getting a feel for what the lived experience was of having these diseases and how does it affect your life and how has it changed your relationships and what things can you still do. And, so we started it about five years ago, and the major change we made was rather than medical students, we expanded it to all five of the graduate schools. So we had nursing, pharmacy, dentistry, medicine, and physical therapy. Um, and we also made it a four-credit elective in the School of Medicine. So people didn't have to volunteer their time. They actually got credit for doing it. Um, and it was an incredible opportunity for patients to share what this was like. Um, and people took it incredibly serious. We've called them faculty, um, and they really took to heart sharing this experience with people, and the students have actually, several of them, really kept up a relationship over the course of time. So there are things out there. I'm and just gonna add one more thing. Um, the Experience Corp is uh, like AmeriCorps for people who have retired, and they've actually done research on this that um, it can help reverse frailty um, for older adults. So uh, large, uh, most of the, the volunteering opportunities are in schools helping kids um, read. So that's just not And I was just going to mention that right now we have a uh, photographer who's a trainee in our, in our center who is leading a project trying to meet uh, patients or part research participants that have MCI from any cause uh, with the goal of generating an artistic project that would generate awareness around this specific state um, and change the narrative around a little bit around that concept. The question is around maybe uh, uh, comments around the genetics of Alzheimer's. So, so I don't know whether you guys have talked about it already yes. in the course. But um, so most people, so there's a very rare form of Alzheimer's disease that strikes people who are very young and that runs in families. And there they have um, uh, mutations or genetic changes that affect the amyloid protein. But that's very, very rare. It's a very, uh, and only a you know, small number of people um, likely have that as, as a genetic cause of their Alzheimer's disease. More likely, the evidence suggests that most people get Alzheimer's disease. Um, well, there's, uh, there are risk factors, and there may be a combination of different risk factors. The strongest one that you may have heard about already is called apolipoprotein E4. Um, and that likely does a number of bad things in the brain. It might raise the level, level of amyloid, but it might also increase inflammation. And then there now, more recently, there have been about 30 other genes that have been identified that all have a tiny little effect. So individually, they don't cause Alzheimer's disease. But sometimes, for some, there's some combination. Maybe you need 15 different changes and 15 of these different genes, and they add up in some way that you know predispose you to getting Alzheimer's disease. But interestingly, if when researchers have looked at what all these little changes do, um, most of these changes add up to uh, changes in how your immune system <coughs> functions, and particularly one form of the immune system called the innate immune system, which sort of recognizes foreign objects and, and foreign proteins and um, responds to it. And so, um, may, so it's probably that um, it's a comp very complicated genetic um, set of changes that, that we can't really pinpoint any one individual. Um, but that you know, there may be ways that people are developing to try and come up with risk scores that um, can help us to understand the genetic risk. And some people estimate that up to 80% of your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease may be a combination of these 30 or 40 different genes. And this is the concept of polygenic risk score, if you want to read more about it. So the question is, uh, what are we learning from global communities that are experiencing the same challenges around uh, neurodegenerative disease? Maybe you should answer that one. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, um, uh, coincidentally, that's going to be the topic of another uh, lecture. We <laughs> I would just say um, we had but the we, we can say Alzheimer's Disease International Organization, yeah. which and and they mentioned um, Singapore, which is the place where I got the video from. And it sounds like um, someone high up in politics there has been personally affected by dementia, and that has led to the mobilization of a lot of. Um, resources around social care, so um, they have a lot of support for families and patients with dementia. Um, I also was just in Minnesota, and um, they have actually That's mobilized. International, right? 
resources there. Um, you know, I think really it, it comes to communities and getting involved on a local level and advocating for um, services. And, and the, yeah, this is the reason, uh, you may have seen in our slides, we have a, a GBHI logo, the Global Brain Health Institute. Your question is, in part, the reason why this institute was founded. Uh, we're trying to, this is a program that uh, we run in, in, in partnership with uh, Dublin, uh, Trinity College in Dublin. And its, its aim is exactly that, to try to bring together different parts of the world to this mission of creating awareness about these diseases, what, what are different countries doing, individuals within countries, and develop leaders in, in, each, in, in each region that are working collaboratively across the world. So you're going to hear more about that program in, in the context of the global burden of these diseases um, and what we're doing at a grander scale. I, yes. I, have, a, I have a comment, quick comment about sure. how, what we're learning in bringing new therapies, not from other communities, but from other medical communities. As Dr. Boxer mentioned, we're learning from how successful fields uh, came up with new therapies like in cancer. We're copying the strategy that they're bringing. And Dr. Boxer has been instrumental in exploring these uh, new uh, uh, intelligent, smarter, better trials. For example, trials that may bring the infusion to your house every month. Uh, because especially in these trials that are so long, that are uh, so involved, or the concept of everyone should get an, a chance to get the actual drug at the, at the end of the trial. Everyone should have an open label phase where, you know, it's an experiment initially, but everyone should get. So we are learning from other communities as well in, in that regard. Great point. Thank so you for bringing that up. That's also a major issue. And actually in San Francisco, I think it's a third of older adults um, live alone and, and don't have family caregivers. So again, I think it's for communities um, to determine um, how to you know, support people. There are programs like the Program for All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. Um, Onlock was the founding program that um, are designed to provide wraparound care um, for people and help them age in place. And we're working um, with the Curry Senior Center, which is a safety net clinic in the Tenderloin. Um, and we have a care navigator there who does home visits and helps people go to appointments and um, figure out how to manage their medications. So there's some ad hoc um, you know, services, there's an organization called Homebridge in San Francisco that will manage um, in-home supportive services workers for people who aren't able to manage it on their, for, for themselves. Uh, but I think there is a real need for more options for people um, because they are at higher risk for being placed in a nursing home when they don't really need to be um, because they don't have the family support. Yeah, so that's a good question. So. Um there are probably different forms of um, brain damage from traumatic brain injury, and the the chronic traumatic brain injury that we that we've heard a lot about from the group in Boston and in football players, particularly, and maybe some veterans, is um, we think is uh, is very strongly linked to this protein called tau. Not so much amyloid, but very strongly linked to tau, um, and. Uh, it, it, but we're not sure how prevalent that really is. It, it may be just prevalent in, in football players, and, and, and so there are other forms of traumatic brain injury that might come from like a, a single bad injury, like an accident or a blast in the military, and that doesn't involve <laughs> tau, probably. It's probably a different process. Yeah, no, well, I think we don't exactly know. Um, so, and I'm not sure whether Christine Yaffe has talked yet. Uh, She's or, coming uh, okay. next week. So one of our colleagues next week <laughs> it, um, it has led some studies, um, particularly involving some older veterans, and has really um, identified, she and her coworkers, that, um, you know, that having these uh, different brain injuries or um, exposures, you know, young at early time, when they're young adults, really predisposes to cognitive impairment and dementia later on. Um, whether all of it is Alzheimer's disease or something else, I think we're not sure yet, but uh, Dr. Yaffe is like the world's expert, so she can tell you more. Well, thank you all for coming again, and until next week.